where did God come from? Well, these people don't know, but they're sure going to spout off about it because, hey, they're religious. Because that's what the religious do. They make crap up, and then they pretend that because it makes them feel good, it's got to be so. And no, it doesn't work that way. None of this works that way. Today, we look at World Video Bible School as Eric Lyons tries to tell us where God came from. Or rather, he simply asserts his beliefs about where God came from as though it was absolute fact. Because these people don't have the slightest clue how facts actually operate. They're not interested. It's all feels, no reals. Because reels are scary, and they can't have that, can they? So let's watch Eric make a fool of himself while we sit back, point out all of the places where he's wrong, and just laugh. Where did God come from? Well, that assumes that God exists in the first place, doesn't it? But you won't address that part of it because you just don't care. Now, this is a huge problem for the religious and one that I've pointed out a lot, but they're just asserting that God is real at all without having the slightest shred of evidence to back any of it up. I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you teach. I care what you can prove. And until you can prove something, anything about your magical father figure in the sky, it's not worth considering as a real possibility. But that doesn't matter to you, does it? And that's a problem. Most everyone knows the Christian's response to this question. God is eternal. He did not come from anywhere. And where exactly did you get that information? Not why do you believe it, I mean, how did you come up with it in the first place? Now, sure, most of them are going to say the Bible, which just moves the question back a step. How did the people who wrote the Bible, whoever the hell they were, get that information? And more importantly, I think, how did any of you validate it? Because finding claims is easy. Unjustified claims are a dime a dozen. Anyone can make anything up. That doesn't make it worth considering. My question is always, how do you know? How did you determine that this claim is worth believing? How did you test this claim to see if it stands up to rational and critical muster? And the answer, of course, is they didn't. They don't care. It's an emotional argument made because the idea makes them feel good. Whether or not it's true, well, that's irrelevant. They not only don't care, they don't even try. Anyone can pull an empty claim right out of their ass. It takes a credible person to test it to determine if it's valid in the first place. And the religious are not credible people. Although atheists may think that this answer is unscientific and merely an attempt to avoid the question, in truth, observation and reason declare otherwise. Wait, what? Because I don't think you have any idea what those terms actually mean. Now, of course, I know he's going to pull the typical theist, something I don't understand exists, therefore God nonsense. But we're talking about actual characteristics of a real, actually existing deity here. If you want to argue that said deity is real and actually has these characteristics, you need to do more than just flap your lips. You can't just make claims. You need to provide evidence. And that's the one thing the religious can never, ever, ever do. The question, where did God come from, or what caused God, assumes that God had a cause. 
Just like, as I'm sure we're going to see in a minute, your own beliefs assume that God didn't have a cause. It's all just assumptions. No evidence, no facts, just empty claims based on emotional comfort. But emotional comfort, it doesn't actually mean anything. You can yank whatever you want right out of your ass, and it just stinks. It doesn't make it intellectually valid. And that's why he's not talking to the people who understand that or who would point it out. He's talking to the mindless yes-men who just nod their heads because it makes them feel good. That's kind of sad, isn't it? However, by definition, an eternal spirit, the everlasting God, cannot logically have a cause. And where did you get that definition? All he's really saying is that according to his pre-existing blind faith and emotionally comforting beliefs, that's what he'd really like to think is true. Therefore, without any evidence whatsoever, he's going to insist that it is just because. And that's not how a rational definition works. He's going to spend a lot of time saying, by definition, in this video. But ask yourself where these supposed definitions come from and how they're rationally determined. They mean nothing because his beliefs mean nothing. It's an important thing to understand. Asking about God's cause is as incoherent as asking why matter is eternal. Nobody says that it is, and for anyone who did make that claim, I'd expect them to come up with objectively verifiable evidence that their claim was valid, just like I expect the religious to come up with objectively verifiable evidence that their God is real. In the absence of such, there's no reason to take either claim seriously whatsoever. Matter's not eternal. Matter is no more an eternal essence without a cause than God is a physical being with a cause. Again, says who? Because this is pretty much his entire argument. And that is to say, he doesn't really have one. Talking to theists is like talking to cryptozoologists. Of course all of these creatures are real. They believe it, so they don't have to actually prove anything. It's already a foregone conclusion in their tiny little mind. Evidence? Well, they don't need evidence. Why would they need evidence? If you don't believe us, well, then you're just wrong. It's why talking to these people is such a waste of time. Asking where did God come from is like asking when did eternity start? Who is asking that? Because I don't know of anyone claiming that any actual eternity exists. You are claiming that this magical pal of yours does, though. Therefore, it rests entirely on your shoulders to prove it. And as I pointed out earlier, this is all just based on his emotionally comforting blind faith. He has nothing else. When we ask for more, he just kind of looks at us funny. Why would anybody ask for more? He's obviously right, don't you know? Except absolutely none of this works like that. Just because you like the idea, that doesn't mean the idea is true. You have to do a whole lot better than that. By definition, eternity never began. Yes, because that is the dictionary definition of the word. But it's just a concept that no one is claiming exists in reality. You are just making up characteristics for your imaginary friend, which cannot be validated in reality just because it gives you an emotional woody to think that it's true. And that's the difference. One is a concept. One is a claimed fact. One requires validation, and the other does not. You guys are on the wrong side of the intellectual divide here. If you want to prove any of this stuff, you need to get to work. Eternity is without beginning and end. By definition, so is God. Whose definition and how do you know? 
because we can step back and redefine the word eternity into something entirely different and then just declare, well, by definition, eternity has a beginning and an end. Well, all right, what did you actually accomplish by doing that? You can say, by definition, eternity is a ham sandwich. What does that actually do for you? Nothing? Same as just making up and arbitrarily assigning characteristics to an imaginary man in the sky. You can't fail worse than you're failing right now. You just can't. Friends, from what we observe in nature, matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed. That's not actually the first law of thermodynamics. In reality, it states that the total energy of an isolated system is constant. Now, what is an isolated system? It's a system that does not exchange energy with any outside systems. Does that apply to the universe? Well, we honestly just don't know. For all we know, there could be a vast multiverse out there that shares an overall amount of energy, and from time to time, through entirely naturalistic means, it just squeezes off individual universes that survive for a time and then vanish back into the larger whole. Now, we don't know that. I just made that up but it certainly is a possibility that the religious don't want to talk about. Why? Because they need some way to justify their magical thinking, so presenting a straw man version of reality and then setting up a false dichotomy with their beliefs, it's the only way they have of seeming at least somewhat reasonable. Yet nothing they're saying is really all that reasonable. Funny how that works, huh? Scientists refer to this observed fact as the first law of thermodynamics. No, they don't. That's a vastly dumbed-down version of the first law of thermodynamics. But considering the likely scientific ignorance of your intended audience, yeah, I guess that's really no surprise. Evolutionists allege that the universe began with the explosion of a ball of matter 13 to 14 billion years ago. Evolutionists do nothing of the sort because there's no such thing as an evolutionist. And evolution has nothing at all to do with the Big Bang. That's cosmology, and you're an idiot. But all of this just points to the fact that he really hasn't got a clue what the hell he's talking about. All of this is based on less than a high school level of knowledge about the natural sciences. And where did this knowledge come from? Well, obviously, it was spewed out by other religious apologists who purposely crafted it to look stupid. Then, it all just gets passed down from one ignorant mouth to the next by people who don't care enough to see if any of these explanations are actually scientifically valid in the first place. Because that would be hard, and these people aren't that smart. Yet they've never provided a reasonable explanation for the cause of this supposed original ball of matter. Quantum mechanics. It was a quantum fluctuation. Now this is nothing new. We've known this for a long time. But of course, when you don't really know anything, you don't have anything to teach to anyone else. It's all ignorance rolling downhill. An attempt was made a few years ago in an issue of New Scientist magazine titled The Beginning, What Triggered the Big Bang. Notice, however, what the evolutionist David Shiga stated in the last line of the article. The quest to understand the origin of the universe seems destined to continue until we can answer a deeper question. Why is there anything at all instead of nothing? Which really isn't a valid scientific question. Science only deals with things that are. There is something. Science explores what that something is. If there was nothing, not only would science not be able to explore it, but science wouldn't exist because humans wouldn't exist. And let's be honest, New Scientist isn't the most reputable source out there. 
In 2006, author Greg Egan criticized the magazine, citing, quote, a sensationalist bent and a lack of basic knowledge by its writers, making the magazine increasingly unreliable, or in Egan's words, to constitute a real threat to the public understanding of science. The editor at the time responded, saying that New Scientist was an ideas magazine. That means writing about hypotheses as well as theories. In other words, especially considering how much it gets blatantly wrong, it's just a rag. But this is the best the video maker can do, I'm sure. The fact is, a logical, naturalistic explanation for the origin of the original ball of matter that supposedly led to the universe does not exist. Except it does, and it has for a very, very, very long time. But yeah, shh, don't tell anyone. It'll get in the way of your absurd narrative. It cannot exist so long as the first law of thermodynamics is true, that matter and energy cannot create themselves. You know, I think we've sufficiently established that this guy wouldn't know what credible science was if his life depended on it. So we'll just move on. Now keep that in mind though, because it applies to pretty much every religious apologist out there. Either they don't know any better, so they just make a fool of themselves, or they do know better, but they're getting a paycheck out of lying, so they're just spinning it in a way that keeps the collection plates filled. Take your pick. Since the physical universe exists, and yet it could not have created itself, then the universe is either eternal, or something, or someone outside of the universe must have created it. And that's where you start to get into pandering to your religious audience. Because saying something or someone must have created it, that implies intent. And that, of course, is what you're going for. He wants his audience to assume, without evidence, that the universe was intended to be here as we see it. But this is not evident in any rational way. Like I said, quantum fluctuations are the most likely cause of the Big Bang. No intelligence, no intent, no purpose. And that doesn't make people feel good, so they don't want to talk about that. It's all about the feelings, after all. Relatively few scientists propose that the universe is eternal. Yes, that is true. But it doesn't mean that your false dichotomy has any validity. There are other alternatives, such as the one that seems most likely to be the case. But you don't want to talk about that, do you? In fact, there would be no point in attempting to explain the beginning of the universe, with the Big Bang, for example, if scientists believed it's always existed. What's more, the second law of thermodynamics, which states that matter and energy become less usable over time, has led scientists to conclude that the universe has not always existed. That is, it's not eternal. Not in its current form, no. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other alternatives to always existing. A universe that constantly expands and contracts, for instance, or a multiverse, or many other possibilities. But that doesn't work for the model that he's trying to propose, where he suggests two and only two possibilities, arbitrarily disposes of one of them, and then insists, without actually having to support it, that the remaining alternative that he puts out there has to be the right one, because there's nothing else left. This is a logical fallacy. But this is also religion, so how is that any surprise? So why don't the laws of thermodynamics, or the law of causality, apply to God? Because you just made God up and assigned whatever characteristics to God that you felt were most impressive and emotionally comforting at the time, of course. Because these scientific laws, like all scientific laws, apply to what we find and study in nature. And again, by definition, God is not natural, and thus is logically not subject to the laws of nature. Who says God is not natural? Who says anything is not natural? 
we have yet to find a single example of anything that is not natural. Yep, here he goes, yanking an ad hoc explanation straight out of his butthole because it fulfills a childish emotional need for himself and his followers. You don't just get to define God into existence because it makes you feel good, and that's all he's done. It's all any apologist can do. It's why you have to go back and ask how they know any of this. How do they know? This is what God is like? How do you know? This is what God wants? How do you know? Prove it. Let's see your evidence. How did you make that determination rationally? Where did you get your information and how did you test it to see if it stands up to any critical scrutiny? Because the answer is, they didn't. They haven't got a clue. It's all just made up. If matter is not eternal and it cannot create itself, then the only logical conclusion is that something or someone outside of nature who is supernatural caused the material universe and everything in it. Which is just a claim you yanked straight out of your ass. I've already pointed out that there are other options. This false dichotomy nonsense just doesn't fly. You need to be able to independently support with objective evidence, your own ideas and pit them head to head with other credible ideas to see which one stands the test of rationality. And yours doesn't. Not one bit. It's no better than saying that, hey, why not? Harry Potter just waved his wand and everything came into existence. In fact, that's pretty much what you're saying. Except Harry Potter was written better than that stupid book that you believe in. And that's saying something. Christians call this someone the eternal God. They can call it anything they want. It means nothing until they can prove that this eternal God actually exists in the real world. And guess what? They're not even close. Because he is from everlasting to everlasting. Says you. But that's really all you can do. Say things, not prove things. Just flap your lips and hope that people take you seriously. But they shouldn't. No one should. What you're saying is nonsense until you can back any of it up objectively. And we all know you can't do that. You're not even going to give it a shot. But what does any of this actually mean? When anyone can just make crap up because it feels good and pretend that that somehow makes their beliefs credible. Really, what does it mean? It means that we live in a culture of morons. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be a surprise or not, but that seems to be the case. We are surrounded on all sides with idiots. People who think that they can just redefine reality at a whim because it doesn't make them feel good and nobody better dare question it because, well, that's just horrible. Telling people that their feelings don't come first? What kind of a monster does that? Yeah, any person who has any respect for reality. That's who. Any person who values the truth. That's who. And these people don't. They have no interest. None whatsoever. Why in the world would they? If they had to acknowledge reality, then all of their ridiculous beliefs would implode under the weight of its own irrationality. And they can't have that, not for a second. So they just make it up, and we're expected to sit silently by and smile while they make fools of themselves. Yeah, I think not. You can be a moron. I unfortunately can't stop you but I damn well reserve the right to point it out. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. That you're not says something tremendously unflattering about you. And I'm not going to shut up about it so long as I draw breath. Never. It will never happen. These people can just deal with that. Or they won't, because, you know, they're idiots. Boom, dicky, 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 bo
Dick it bum, 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 dick it